Okay, so good morning. A very warm welcome to this session about narrative reporting. The good old trustees and your report. Three words that fill so many charity trustees with complete dread. I cannot tell you how many charity trustees I've come across that say, trustees and your report, no, I can't do that. It's part of the accounts. I don't get numbers. That's the treasurer's job. Well, in this session, what I'm going to do is help, hopefully, to dispel some of those myths and some of those misconceptions that you might have. Um, and hopefully, anyone that has a fear of the trustees' annual report at the moment, that's going to cease to exist from today onwards. Okay. So let's take a little look about what we're going to cover in this session. So first of all, we're going to look at and discuss really the importance of the trustees' annual report, or the TAR, as I might talk, talk about sometimes. Then we're going to look at actually who is responsible for the preparation. Then getting down really to the nuts and bolts, we're going to look at the content of the report, okay, and think about where the focus of the report should really be and how that actually influences what is actually included. And that will help us to understand what a really good trustees annual report actually does include and what it really starts to look like. And then after that, we'll start to think about for whose benefit a good trustees annual report is for. Who does it really matter to? And then we're going to get quite practical, because I know you like to have something practical to go away with. And I'm going to share with you some of my key sort of do's and don'ts um, before then we conclude with looking at a few examples of reports that might help just to get your creative juices going a little bit. So hopefully that sounds, that sounds sensible. Okay? So Oscar's vision, as Jude said earlier, is for charities that you can trust and that provide public benefit. A key part, as Martin said earlier as well, about being a charity in Scotland. Now, to cha charities traditionally enjoy very, very high levels of trust and confidence, particularly in comparison to many, many other sectors. In fact, the survey results that we published um, last year said that trust in charities hadn't changed really at all over the last two years. And indeed, 8% of those surveyed said that their trust had actually increased in charities. But recent media um, pieces have shown how easily that can be threatened. So, the Trustees Annual Report, it's really important for a whole number of reasons. So firstly, the preparation of Trustees Annual Report is actually a legal requirement and it's a key part of the annual report and accounts, as that very name suggests. Every charity in Scotland, regardless of its size or its form, has to prepare an annual report and accounts and it has to submit these to OSCAR within nine months of its financial year end. But more than that, a trustee's annual report, it's the charity's opportunity, I would say, to tell its story and to help that those reading the annual report and the accounts and those with an interest in finding out more about what the charity does and how the charity actually functions to really get to grips with that. The narrative part of the annual report and accounts should really help to explain what the numbers in the financial statements actually mean, to add much more context and flesh to those numerical bones, if you like. And the report really allows the charity to explain the activities that it's been undertaking during the year and how those activities have helped the charity to deliver the very purposes for which it was set up. And it helps charity trustees to be accountable for the money that they've received in terms of public donations, fundraising campaigns and grants received, for instance, and also to show the difference that they've been able to make to others as a result of receiving those funds. So, who's then responsible for the preparation? So in my experience of working with charities over the last 15 years or so, um, one of the areas that commonly causes a lot of confusion is actually who should prepare the trustees annual report? Who's actually responsible for it? So I'm gonna start off um, hopefully dispelling a few popular misconceptions. So the responsibility does not lie with the charity's accountant, nor the independent examiner, nor the auditor. Um, and neither does it simply lie with whichever one of the trustees is designated as the treasurer for the charity. If I have a pound for every time I've spoken to a, a charity treasurer who says, I just get left to do all the annual report and accounts, nobody else helps me with that, and that's not right, okay? Because the simple answer is that actually every single one of the charity's trustees have the responsibility for preparing the TAR and indeed the accounts. But they can, of course, get assistance. They don't have to do it all on their own. And they can actually delegate the preparation of, of the trustees' annual report to somebody else, for example, a member of staff within the charity. 
But ultimately, the responsibility stays with them, and that's set out in law. There's no getting away from that. And I think it's really important to stress this collective duty that all the trustees have. It is the whole board's responsibility to prepare a set of accounts, including a trustee's annual report. Not just one or two individuals on the board who are nominated by the others to have that. It's everyone's job. So, when you're trying to think about how you start off your trustee's annual report, I normally encourage um, trustees to think about the objectives or the purposes of the charity. And first of all, to make sure that they're really clear about what those are. Okay? So if necessary, go right back to basics and look at the charity's governing document. So if you're a company, go back to look at your memorandum and articles of association. If you're a trust, go back to look at your trust deed. Okay? Read it and think about what those purposes actually mean in practice. And then think about the activities that your charity undertakes in helping to actually achieve those purposes and build the connection between the two. Make sure the two actually do marry up, because if they don't, you've got a problem, okay? But when they do marry up, then that enables you to really let the story of the charity unfold from there. In my experience, when a, when a trustee board really clearly understands the objectives of the charity, and it's able to clearly link those objectives to the activities that the charity is actually undertaking, it's often an awful lot easier for them to actually achieve real excellence in annual reporting, both financial and narrative, because in short, everything really makes sense. When you understand the link between the objectives and the activities, any trustee should be able to quite easily and quite freely, almost off the cuff, explain to any other person that asks what their charity is about and what their purposes are and what activities they do to, to, to achieve those. It's about having real coherence between these two things. So what makes a good TAR? So when we think quite practically then about how you start off actually starting to, to write your TAR, I think these pointers are potentially quite helpful. So firstly, as we said, think about the objectives and be clear about these objectives as we said already. This is really key. Make sure, as a group of trustees, that you understand the objectives and you can explain those to other people. It's absolutely the best place to start. So this is why the charity was set up. Then think about the charity's beneficiaries. Who are you actually trying to help? Or who are you trying to make a difference for? Now, sometimes that might be really quite obvious for your charity, but don't assume that everyone will actually know that. And actually give that some explanation in your annual report. Because if you're hoping to increase maybe donations to your charity, people actually want to know who their money is going to help. Then we've got the three what's, if you like. So the report then needs to cover what was done. Okay, so that's the outputs from the charity. What was achieved, that's the outcomes. And then what difference was actually made, that's the impact. Okay, so maybe a very simple example helped to, to illustrate some of this. So if we think about a charity that has been set up to provide vocational training um, for disadvantaged young adults, okay? So the what was done, so say training was provided for 80 people during the year. What was achieved? The training resulted in 76 people gaining a vocational qualification. What difference was made? So of those 76 people who gained a qualification, 52 have already secured full-time employment which required them to have that qualification that they gained. And you start to see how just using that simple example enables you to say the why, the who, and the three what's. So, let's think about benefits. So we talked earlier about transparency and accountability being demonstrated by a really good, strong trustees annual report. But what about the other benefits? of having a good narrative. Um, fortunately, there are lots of really good benefits, so the trustees can be assured that all the efforts that they're going to put into preparing a good TAR will actually help the charity in a whole bunch of other ways. So, for example, if the report is really well written and it's well communicated and it contains really fundamental key messages about the charity, then the charity can then use it to connect to a really wide range of audiences which allows the trustees annual report potentially, or the text, to be used for different purposes. So, for instance, some charities might choose to use it as a promotional tool. 
And that could be really helpful if the charity is maybe trying to prompt action from others, such as maybe signing a petition, becoming a volunteer, or donating money or goods to the charity. Alternatively, if the charity is engaged in a particular campaign or a project, then a good TAR can help to explain a lot more about that, why it's important to the charity, why the charity is actually undertaking it, and how others can become involved in that too. So a good TAR can actually help the charity to do whatever it is actually trying to do at that point in its lifetime, whether it's simply trying to continue its normal activities, but maybe it needs to seek a bit more support from others to do that, whether it wants to engage in brand new activities and it needs a different kind of support, or whether maybe it needs to contract or change the activities or the services which it's delivering. And it wants to then explain the reasons for that to its outside audience. So all of those things can be achieved by really good open and transparent narrative reporting. And of course, if we think about the earlier press headlines that we looked at, it can also potentially help to deflect bad publicity. So being open and being honest about what's happening is often the best way, I think, to avoid suspicion and rumour. So here come these top tips, folks. Now, this is the practical bit. This is the stuff that you're going to take away and hopefully remember. So hopefully now you're all starting to think that actually preparing a really good trustees annual report, it's not an insurmountable task. It's not something to be frightened of, and it is something that you can engage in, even if you haven't done so before. So, I've got five top tips here for you, okay? So the first one, remember what we talked about. Tell the story of what you did and the difference that the charity made. So we've covered that today as a really key content point. So what did you do and what difference did you make? Remember, obviously, to comply with the content and the time requirements. So the content of the annual report is actually set out in regulations, the Charities Accounts Regulations 2006. If you're a small, unincorporated charity and you're preparing receipts and payments accounts, the requirements are set out quite simply in Schedule 2 of those regulations. If you're preparing accrued accounts, that means if you're a larger charity or if you're a company, then you're actually you're looking at the charity statement of recommended practice to understand what you need to include in your TAR. Okay, And remember that regardless of what size or what legal form your charity is, you have to submit your annual report and your accounts and also your annual return to OSCAR within nine months of the financial year end. The third, third tip I have for you is really take ownership and engage actively in this process. This applies to every single charity trustee. Please, please do not leave this task to just one member of your board. Work together and use the very passion and the enthusiasm for what that charity is about, which is why you became involved in the charity in the first place. That's what it all boils down to. And then, think about being creative, okay? Think about different ways in which you can communicate. You don't have to just have a trustee's annual report that is simply text. It doesn't have to be pages and pages of just boring text. And it, often, it's actually better if it is using different media. So you can present information in different ways. You can use diagrams, you can use tables, graphs, and also remember that a picture can paint a thousand words, and that's, I think, really, really true when you come to the trustees' annual report. And I'm going to show you in some of the examples at the end what that actually might look like. If you're trying to actually communicate really key messages to an audience who might not have read a trustees' annual report before, or maybe a potential funder who's maybe reading lots and lots and lots of these, then you want to ensure that the person who's reading it comes away with a really good, solid understanding of what your charity is doing. And don't make them work too hard to find that out. Make it really easy for them to see that. And lastly, take time to think about what is suitable and what's appropriate for your charity. Jude talked earlier about the massive diversity that exists within the Scottish charity sector. 24,000 charities and every single one is so different, not least because we have a whole range of different sizes of organisations, but we also have such different activities and purposes that are, that are happening within those 24,000 charities. So think about what works for your charity, okay? So... Here's my don'ts, things to really seriously avoid. 
So the first thing I would say, please avoid leaving it to the last minute. You want this report to be something that your charity can be really proud of and that is of great benefit to you. So that is going to take time. So start early and do the best that you can, okay? Do not, as we said earlier, do not leave it to just one person. It's not just the treasurer's job and it's not just one trustee's job. Engage all the charity trustees in the process, okay? And I think try to avoid using complicated language. Try to avoid using jargon or just maybe relying on numeric information. Keep it simple and explain things. And for goodness sake, please, please do not use the same text as you did last year, but with the dates changed. Keep it interesting. You're not seriously telling me that from one year to the next that every charity just does the same thing, because I don't believe that. Even organisations that you might think might be relatively the same from year to year, like maybe um, a brownie pack or a, or a scout group, you might think they do just the same thing year after year. But I'd be willing to bet that there are differences. So, for example, the scout group might go on a, a kayaking trip in one year, but they might not do that the next year. The next year they might go on, I don't know, a hill walk or something like that. There'll always be something different that means you can keep it interesting and keep it fresh. And don't make assumptions that people automatically know what your charity does from its name or indeed its reputation. It might not be obvious to people who are trying to engage with your charity for the first time. So don't make assumptions, go right back to basics. And I'd also say that when things don't go to plan, be honest about that. There's no need to shy away from maybe a change of circumstances or a plan that maybe didn't bottom out as you originally anticipated. And a lot can actually be learned from an experience like that. And there's nothing wrong with explaining that things have changed or circumstances have changed that necessitated a change in the activities for the year. So, I promise you some examples. So here we are. Now, these examples, hopefully, I've got three examples that I'm going to round off with here. And these are from small, medium and large charities. And hopefully these are going to help to illustrate that size isn't a barrier to communicating really key messages effectively and also that very different approaches are needed for different charities. So the first one we're going to start with is for a small charity. Now, I don't expect you to be able to read the text, don't, don't worry about that. But hopefully you can see that we've got a mixture of text and imagery on that, on that trustee's annual report. So... This is from a, a small faith-based charity. It's St. James's Episcopal Church in Leith. Now, this charity actually publishes their annual report and their accounts on their own website. And this is actually a screenshot from their report, which I've chosen to let you see how even really a small charity can use a slightly different method of communication. So in this case, obviously, they're using photos to illustrate some of the activities which they talk about in their report. And this, I think, potentially helps the reader to see what those activities might involve and maybe even to consider how they might want to engage in those activities in the future. Now, those among you that have really, really keen eyesight might also pick up on the, the outline that they've given of their objectives on the left of the page, and then the link to their activities during the year on the right-hand side. And you remember what I talked about earlier. It's about linking the two, linking the, you know, why are we set up and what are we actually trying to do. The next example is from a slightly larger charity. This is Stirlingshire Voluntary Enterprise. Now, this kind of infographic, if you like, it wasn't actually part of their annual report and for, the, for the charity, but it was instead it was published alongside it. But I think it's a, a really strong example of how a whole bunch of different key facts about the charity can actually be portrayed in a really interesting and a very eye-catching way. And there's absolutely no reason why your trustee's annual report couldn't include that as one of its pages, or even little segments of it to try and break up some of the text in the report, just to add a bit of variety. Lastly, this is my personal favourite because I'm a great dog lover. Um, anyone who's a dog lover is going to have a wee smile at this one. This is the Dogs Trust 2015 annual report, and I have to say, for me, it really uses imagery to, to sort of maximum effect. And I've picked out sort of two pages from this one. So this first one here is right at the start of their annual report. And this is where they clearly explain their objectives or the mission, as this charity terms it. And the second page, here we are, um, outlines the goals and the aims that the charity had for the year and then how they got on with those, plus the plans for the coming year. 
And again, I think having that overall objective of the charity sort of really clearly articulated up front, that's the page before that one, really helps, I think, with setting the aims for the year and reflecting also on how well those have been met. So I hope that's provided some really good food for thought for you all. I hope it's really stirred up some of your enthusiasm for having a go at producing a really dynamic, a really interesting and a really enlightening report for your charity next time round. And I'm really, with all my Oscar colleagues, we're really looking forward to seeing what you guys can actually do.